This morning I'm going to read from Psalm 86, verses 11 through 13. The Word says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us go to the Lord in prayer, please. Let us pray for this service. Let us pray for each other. Let us repent of our sins and, and give our hearts to the Lord. Would you please humble yourself with me right now? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, mighty God, we humble ourselves before you. We know that you are God Almighty and there is no other. We know that you are creator and holy and righteous. We know, Lord, that we are sinners and we have failed you, Lord. But you have provided a way and that way is your Son, the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus who is the Christ. We believe that you are the Son of God. You are God Almighty and we believe that you died on the cross. You redeemed us. You paid the price. You became our sin. But you're alive today, risen in power and glory and your Spirit is with us. Holy Spirit, anoint us, Lord. Please Lord, use us for your glory. May we worship you in spirit. May we glorify you and please you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. We repent and we come before you and we say, Lord, cleanse us, Lord. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Please cover us. Please forgive us and have mercy on us. Lord, I pray, Lord, for every soul, every family that hears this message, Lord, that hears this service, Lord. Lord, please be with us, Lord. Touch our hearts. Touch our minds. Let us draw near to you. Lord, we are in your hands, and we gladly and, Lord, we thankfully put ourselves right there, Lord, in your hands. Deal with us, Lord, because you are a merciful, loving God. If we need conviction, then convict our hearts. Lord, if we need you, Lord, your joy, give us your joy. Give us your peace, Lord, for your glory. Let us now come into your presence. Let us worship you in spirit. Let us give you all the glory. For, Lord, you are our God, and we are your people. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now we're going to sing... Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is the health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. A praise to the Lord, who all hosts all things a shelter under his wing they so gently sustain us. Hast thou not seen how thy desires ever have been granted in what ye ordain us? A praise to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore Him. All that have life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the harmony sound from His people again, a gladly for a week. Him. Amen. My 
Savior loves me.
엎드려 부르짖어 이르되 아하 주 여호와여 예루살렘을 향하여 분노를 쏟으시오니 이스라엘의 남은 자를 모두 멸하려 하시나이까 그가 내게 이르시되 이스라엘과 유다 족속의 죄악, 죄악이 심히 중하여 그 땅에 피가 가득하며 그 성읍에 불법이 찬나니 이는 그들이 이르기를 여호와께서 이 땅을 버리셨으며 여호와께서 보지 아니하신다 함이라 그러므로 내가 그들을 불쌍히 여기지 아니하며 궁유를 베풀지 아니하고 그들의 행위대로 그들을 머리에 갚으리라 하시더라 보라 가는 배옷을 입고 허리에 먹그릇을 찬 사람이 복명하여 가르 이르되 주께서 내게 명령하신 대로 내가 준행하였나이다 하더라 아멘. Ezekiel chapter 9 verses 1 through 11. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, "Bring the guards of the city here, each with a weapon in his hand." And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen, who had a riding kit at his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of God of Israel went up from above the cherubim, where it had been, and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen, who had the riding kit at his side, and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the forehead of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, Follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or passion. Slaughter old men, young men, and maidens, and women, and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were in front of the temple. He said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go! So they went out and began killing throughout the city. And while they were killing, I was left alone, and I fell down, face, cry, face down, crying out, O oh, sovereign Lord, are you going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? He answered me, the sin of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city is full of injustice. They say the Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord does not see. So I will not look on them with pity or spare them, but I will bring down on their own heads what they have done. Then the man in linen with the riding kit at his side brought back word saying, I have done as you commanded. Amen. May the Lord have blessing to read this holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, mighty God, thank you for this, your holy word and this message and the people, Lord, who hear your word. Lord, may you give us, through the power of your Holy Spirit, eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this day. May this message glorify you and accomplish your good and perfect will. Lord, we want to please you. We want to come into your presence. As unworthy as we are, Lord, we claim the blood of Jesus. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. This morning, it's very obvious, God's vengeance. Vengeance, you know, is a very touchy word. Very touchy and, and even a very unpleasant word. Nobody, even when I hear the word vengeance, it sort of makes me cringe a little bit, you know. The, the hairs on my back sort of stand up. Yes, I have a hairy back, sorry. But, you know, it's, that's the way I feel, you know. You know, on the one hand, God says, vengeance is mine. But as a society and, and as a government, we are to execute God's vengeance. We're supposed to do what he tells us to do. And let's think about this this morning. I want to think about the difference between personal vengeance and God's directed vengeance. You know, we live in a sinful world. I, I remind you guys of that, and I don't really need to because you know that, right? Because we know that people all over the world are being murdered all around us, even close to us. 
so many murders, it seems like, happens in our area. Thank God we're not like as bad as some places, but one a year is one too many. Can we stand by idly and just let people be murdered without cause? Can we do that? Can we forgive the men and women who commit murder? Can we do that? Some continue to murder others, and, and they even have a history of murder. And it seems like they are anger, they can't control their anger, or whatever the reason, they've killed more than just one. Are we allowed to return fire, so to speak? You know, are we allowed to do that? Can we defend ourselves? Can, are we allowed to protect our loved ones, our families, and ourselves? Are we allowed to do that? Does God avenge? Or do we? Is God judging America? Or is he calling America to start judging wicked men? First, let me say this. I cannot find any examples in God's word where we are told to allow a murderer to continue. I can't find it any place. I can't find where God tells us, oh, let them murder them, let them murder them, it's okay. We are commanded very clearly to stand against evil. Very clearly, as Christians, as God's children, we are commanded to stand against evil. But, Having said that, we are given very specific instructions and guidelines on how to do that. And I understand why, because left on our own, guess what? If we're not careful, we will become like them. If we're not very careful in how we execute God's judgment, God's vengeance, we will be like them. We will be like the ones we are judging. We will be like the ones that are committing the evil. If we become like our enemies, how can we be judges against our enemies? If we're doing the same thing the enemy's doing, can we judge the enemy? If we don't fight against wickedness, what is the result? You know, we have many examples in history where wickedness was not opposed. Even modern history. We have quite a few even in modern history where we see where wickedness, people just ignored it. If you look across history, you, you see one pattern that just stands tall. Not one, not one tyrant has ever plagued the world without apathy on the part of those who should have stood against him. They should have stood against this person. Hitler rose to power without any opposition, without any real opposition. Now, I know you've heard about some opposition, but they waited too late. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was the only pastor in Germany that we know of who openly opposed Hitler. And there was a lot of churches there and a lot of pastors, but he's the only one who openly opposed Hitler. Hitler preached hate, and he used hate to paint a rosy picture of Germany's glorious future. Where were the Christians? How could the Christians stand by and let them mistreat the God's people, Israel? How could the Jews, how could Christians let that happen? How could they let hate be so dominant? How could the Christians who went to church and preached against it, how could they allow it to happen? Where were the Christians? They, they either sided with Hitler and, and they believed that, oh, they were enlightened and maybe they were fooled or they were just silent. Just silent and said nothing, and let it happen. Hitler rose to power only because he was unopposed until it was too late. 
by that I mean it was too late because he had so much power he couldn't be stopped. By the time he had the power and some people tried to oppose him, it was too late. Brothers and sisters, evil never stays within its boundaries. Evil always gets bigger and bigger. If it's not stopped, evil always grows. Righteousness, on the other hand, doesn't grow like evil does. Unfortunately, sometimes the only way to peace is to stop those. Stop those whose goal it is to take away the peace. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Who is the peacemaker? Who are these peacemakers that Jesus is talking about? In the glory days of, of Israel, there was one that stood out, he was a warrior, and his name was King David, and he was used by God to give Israel peace by, def by actually defeating the troubled, troubling nations around them. All the nations that were against the Jews, all the nations that were trying to hurt Israel. God used David to destroy them, to conquer them. David killed Goliath and defeated countless enemies of God through battle, through death. Yet David was still called a man after God's own heart. Yes, what he could do after that was maybe limited because he was a man of blood. But he still had God's heart. And God used him and put him in the right place at the right time. Hallelujah. It was David who wrote in Psalm 29, 11, he said, The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. He also wrote in Psalm 34, 14, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And Peter quoted that uh, scripture in 1 Peter 3.11. God gives strength to the righteous people, and he gives that strength to us to stand against evil and establish peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peace is not the absence of war. Now, I know sometimes we get confused a little bit on some words, but let me tell you, peace is not the absence of war. People living in fear have no peace. They may not be at war, but there's no peace because they're afraid. In fact, today, some of you are afraid. Do you figure you have peace? Do you feel like you have peace because you're afraid? What are you afraid of? I don't think being afraid... To live my life afraid to live and do what God's told me to do I don't think there's much peace in that what do you think we don't need wars we don't have to be a war to have no peace look back at the great tyrants and the murderers of history Wickedness always grows and spreads if it is tolerated and not stopped. When wicked men become strong, how do we, how do we deal with them? How, how do we stand against them without becoming like them? See, that, that's a very hard question to answer sometimes. How do we... How do we deal with evil people, bad people, without being bad ourselves? Well, first, let's make sure we get some facts straight. Whose vengeance are we talking about? Whose vengeance? God says that vengeance belongs to him. Belongs to him. God said in Deuteronomy 32, 35, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. That's what God says. 
very clearly. It's not, there's no translation problem there. God says, His is to avenge, and His is to repay. There's no translation problem. Romans 12, 19 says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Paul knew exactly when he wrote Romans, he knew exactly what God had said when it comes to vengeance. Now, we've all heard that before. We've all read the Bible's command that vengeance belongs to God. Haven't we? I didn't tell you something you didn't already know. However, in Romans 13, we are taught something more. We are taught to honor the governing authorities and that it is government's God's appointed rule or role to uphold righteousness and judge wickedness. Now, did you hear what I just said? We are to pray for the government. The government is put there by God. He appoints the government, because, and it's government's role to uphold righteousness and judge wickedness. The Bible clearly tells us that that authority that the government has is appointed by God. And the government is God's minister to execute his judgment and his wrath against evil and evildoers. The Bible makes a very clear distinction between personal vengeance and governing vengeance. Personal vengeance Government, government vengeance. Personal vengeance, just throw it away because there's no such thing. Belongs to God or the government. The government. You and I, we do not have the right to place ourselves in God's role. You and I, we don't have the right to do that. We don't have the right to judge and execute wrath against anyone. I do believe we have the right to protect ourselves. God's given us the right and ability to do that, to protect ourselves, but he does not give us the right to avenge. Does an individual have a right to execute justice against evildoers? Do we have the right? Well, not according to God's word, we don't. No, we do not have the right. However, a government has been appointed as a minister of that responsibility. In other words, you don't have the right to avenge anything or anyone, but the government has a responsibility to do so. If, there were, if this was not true, then... Really, the Bible would be a book of anarchy, if you think about it, if this wasn't true. Without government accountability, there's no rule of law, and wickedness always abounds. It's, if you ask me, it's, it's really irrational and unbiblical to allow evil to oppress and destroy we also must ensure that we're not the ones that's being judged. In the Bible, we see that God frequently uses wicked authority to judge those who abandon righteousness. That's an important statement. I hope you understood it. God uses often wicked authority to judge those who abandon righteousness. Just like when the Babylonians, they attacked and overcame Israel. Babylon was not a godly nation. God used their wickedness, used them to inflict his vengeance on his people. Evil only stands when righteousness is abandoned. Before anyone has a right to demand justice, they must first judge themselves. Judge yourself. 
Check yourself. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. You know, the emphasis that most people put on this passage is almost always on prayer. But we see much more here than just prayer in this passage. There must be what? What's the first thing they are to do? They are to humble themselves and then pray. Humble yourself and pray. You can't pray effectively unless you're humble before God. There must be humility. There must be a self-examination leading us to repentance. We must judge ourselves before we are in any position to address the sins of an enemy. Where is humility? I hear people say, oh, we're strong and, and we are united. But I don't hear many people say, we have sinned. We repent. We need God's strength. Most people have lost the ability to see their own sinfulness. Most churches today, as they teach and preach as though it's a sin to point out that we are sinners. They say, doesn't preaching sort of heap guilt on people? Well, I think on the contrary. Sin only produces guilt if we refuse to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. I know I'm a sinner. I know I sin. I know I fail God every day. And I truly feel bad about it. But at the same time, I know that Jesus paid that price for me. You know? And he paid for it on the cross. I surrender myself to him. What else can I do? I can't be good. I can't stop sinning. I know I'm a sinner, but I trust Jesus. That he is who he said he is. Hallelujah. And if he is who he says he is, and I believe him, <laughs> he says he'll forgive me. Hallelujah. People feel guilty when they love sin more than they love God's mercy. The closer I get to God, the more my sin is exposed. The more I talk to the Lord, the more I know I'm a sinner. If we're not walking with God, we're separated from God. Before God hears our prayers or heals our land and avenges our enemies, we must first allow him to purify our hearts and also for us to surrender our ways to his ways. Hallelujah. That's what we got to do. Have we sinned? Our nation performs thousands of abortions a year, and Christians just sit back and watch. Where's the outcry? How many people sit in front of television every day and take pleasure in the anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-biblical devaluation that pours through it every day? People of America sit idly by while any public display of God is rejected or removed or defaced or destroyed. It makes me sick sometimes on certain things I cannot watch. In 1974, prayer was abandoned from schools, and today there was a fight recently in the Supreme Court just to allow a moment of silence in school. A moment of silence, please. It was argued for this, and kids, they said, well, if we have the, the silence, and some kids, they, they might pray 
during that moment of silence, and that wouldn't be fair to those who don't pray. So because some kids don't want to pray, we're not going to let those who want to pray or have a moment of silence. Where is the outrage, though, against those who want to make it illegal to stand on faith? Where is the outcry from us, from Christians? Before a nation, before a nation can repent, individuals must repent. I can't plead for my nation while I'm blind to my own sins. Who is not in need of repentance? Anybody? We are all under this condemnation until we submit ourselves to Jesus Christ. Are we innocent? God does not look at outward appearance. You know what he looks at? He looks at my heart. He looks at your heart. As Christians, we should strive toward perfection. In fact, I'll tell you right now, if you're truly a Christian, a real Christian, not just one that says a Christian, but you're really belong to God, then I know, you know, that you strive to be perfect. You want to be. I didn't say you were, because you're not. But you try to be, you want to be, but it seems like we tolerate and even accept sin from others. Today, there is even a little bit, just a very small distinction between the church and the world. Practicing sin and accepting sin apparently seems there's very little difference, if any, or no difference at all in God's eyes. Practicing or accepting are the same. When God judged Israel, he told the prophet Ezekiel to behold all the wicked things that the people were doing. Then God called the wicked nations around Israel to prepare to attack. God said in verse 4 of our text today, says, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the forehead of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are being done in it. Didn't he say that? So who were the only people who were counted as righteous? Not those who didn't practice sin. Please understand what I just said. Not those who didn't practice sin. It was those who did not practice, and not only did not practice sin, but they grieved and they lamented over the sins that the people were committing. Think about that for a second. Have we cried over this nation's fall from morality? How much time do you stand in prayer crying out to God about our nation and the pitiful situation, pitiful way we are? Do we mourn over the innocent children that the nations that were, that were slain in the womb? Do we cry for those babies that we are killing legally? Does it matter to you? Do we mourn over the sins that are committed in our nation? Our nation is turning from God. Do we cry and mourn over this nation? We justify ourselves because we say, well, Lord, it's not me. I didn't do it. I'm not doing it. I, I, I'm not killing any children. But God judges the intent of the heart. I can say, well, I justify myself because I've never murdered anyone. Have you? I, Lord, you know, I've never murdered anyone. Okay, so I hate a bunch of people. Are we not guilty? Are we not guilty if we hate people? Are we? I'm no, I'm no different than, I'm no different than the one who commits the act. I may not feel 
from people. I may not rob a bank. I may not take your money. I may not take your car. I might not take your wife. I may not take anything from you. But if I think about it, if I want to do it, if I covet it, do I cheat? Am I guilty? Do I cheat or make money my passion? The first commandment is against idolatry. I can safely say that I've never bowed to an idol. Or can I? Can I really say that? The Bible says that sexual immorality, uncleanness, inornate passion, evil desires, covetousness is idolatry in Colossians 3, 5. All that is guilty idolatry. Why? Because anything that has a higher position, anything we put before God in our lives, that is an idol. Before we as a people and we as a nation can pray for God to heal our land. We must pray for God to first heal us. Lord, heal me. Purify my heart. We will never be perfect. But we must always try and strive toward perfection. I want to be like Jesus. I know, Lord, you know me, you know my heart. I know I probably can't do it, but I want to do it. I want to do it. The Christian life is a joyful lifestyle of repentance, to be honest with you. To me, being a Christian means I'm repenting all the time. I'm joyfully doing it because I know I'm saved. Once saved, always saved. Hallelujah. I have a relationship with Jesus. Yes, I'm a sinner but I know I'm covered by the blood. And once we begin to justify our sin, then repentance is lost. If we justify our sin, we're not repenting. We move ourselves outside of an abiding relationship with God. If we are walking with God, we are free. If we are walking outside of God, there can no really be no confidence in this life or even the life to come. So think about our enemies for a second. Turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Very important. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Follow along as I read Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Hallelujah. How do we pray for true enemies? How do we pray for enemies that destroy and and kill without cause? Our first reaction is to pray against them. You ever notice that? That's our first use of instinct. We, We pray that, Lord, smash them. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. That's why it's very important for us to take care of our hearts first. If I'm not right with God, I can't be in a position to judge wickedness. I can't point anything out to God because I'm just as guilty. If I become like my enemy, if I'm full of hate, if I'm full of wickedness, who will God judge? 
This is where the rubber sort of meets the road. Once my focus shifts from righteous indignation to personal vengeance, guess what? I've stepped outside of the purpose of God. Once I turn from my righteous indignation because of what somebody has done, and now I'm thinking they're guilty, and I'm pointing my fingers at them, and, and I'm doing that, and then I want personal vengeance, I am not walking with God. In fact, turn in your Bibles one more place, if you would, with me, with the book of Psalms, Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Just a few verses here. 139, verses 21 through 24. Psalm 139, verses 21 through 24. Follow along as I read. It says, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, think about this for a second because some people misunderstand this. What is the focus of this passage? I want you to know. I'm going to help you. The focus of this passage is not personal hatred. The Bible strictly forbids this from the beginning of Genesis all the way through Revelation. We are not to hate people. The focus is not on hating those who rise up against me, but hating, I hate the way they attack God, who is a righteous, loving God. That's what he says. King David here is declaring his opposition against those who hate God. It is not a personal hatred, but it is a, what I would call a perfect hatred. He hates the way people are mistreating God. They should glorify him and love him and lift him up, and he hates them for the way they're mistreating God. At the same time, David is pleading for God to what? To look at his own heart to examine his heart, to make sure there's no wickedness, and, and he's seeking purity. Do you notice how they came together? He says, Lord, I hate these people because they don't worship you. They make fun of you. They are against you. Oh, check my heart to make sure I'm not the same. That's what he's saying. Examine yourself. This is the central theme of opposing the wicked. We are opposing the wicked. You know, it's not the focus is not hating those who are against me, but against those who are attacked on a righteous God. King David is declaring his opposition against those who hate God. It's not personal hatred, it's perfect hatred. And at the same time, he's pleading for God to examine his own heart for wickedness and to seek purity. And this is a central thing here, really, of opposing wicked people. Examine yourself. Let God search and reveal your motives. Repentance is being led into God's ways and leaving your ways behind. Only then can we deal with wickedness. The focus is solely on God and not on ourselves. The hatred that the Bible condemns is always self-centered. When our hatred is self-centered, the Bible condemns us. God's Word condemns us. It is good to hate sin, but it's never good to hate the person, the sinner. Like it or not, wicked men and women, guess what? They are still created in the image of God. Like it or not, God desires mercy and not justice. However, God will require justice to the ones who reject mercy and pursues evil and violence. In other words, if you reject God's mercy, if you reject his love, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be punished. 
but he has mercy there for you. You have to take it and accept it. When God judges, he will reject those who rejoice in someone else's misery. I know that many, we think very badly sometimes. So Proverbs 24, though, Proverbs 24, 17 and 18, it says this, Do not gloat. Do not gloat when your enemy falls, when they stumble. Do not let your heart rejoice, or the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them. Even if someone personally harmed me, I don't have the right to rejoice over their misery or trouble. That is so hard for us to do, isn't it? Somebody hurt us and something happens bad to them. What's the first thing we do? Woohoo! Because we're evil. The reason here is the motive of the heart. Maybe I didn't do that, but I wanted it to happen. You know what I'm saying? It's our heart that God looks at. If I want to see someone suffer, I am guilty of personal hatred, and I am too proud to see my own sin. Think about that statement I just made. If I want someone to suffer, I want them to suffer. I want them to have a hard time. If I feel that way, then I'm too, and I, and I say to myself, I'm okay. I'm too proud to see my own sins because we should never feel that way toward anybody. If I want to see someone stop and wickedness judged, then I'm upholding God's truth. In other words, I want that murderer to stop. I don't want him to kill anybody else. Stop him, Lord. Then that's okay. That's what we're doing. We're upholding God's truth. It's okay to rejoice in victory also, but not in another's fall. For example, you know when Japan, uh, when they surrendered in World War II, what did the Americans do? We rejoiced. Hallelujah. The war is over. Japan lost. The war victory had been won, and the world was all of a sudden at peace. But God never condones an in-your-face type of victory. The Bible teaches us that every judgment against man is with a broken heart. God does not desire judgment against anyone. Even our lives, my life, testifies to this because if I got what I deserved I would not be here today preaching to you in this ministry I would be judged with the full wrath of God why did God have mercy why did God have mercy because God desires mercy over judgment. He does. God loved mercy so much that he paid the penalty for my sin in my place on the cross. God doesn't want to judge me and hurt me. He wants to have mercy on me. And it's the same with you, all of us. He'd rather have mercy on you. Our business is this. Once our hearts are right with God, hate for our enemy will not consume our hearts. And we will have the right perspective. We will hate and stand against evil, don't get me wrong, and then we will be able to be used by God. For many, it will be prayer and, and sharing God's hope with the world a living in fear. Today, the world is living in fear. We should tell them there is hope in God Almighty. God has commissioned our government and its military to be ministers of his, ministers of his justice. 
It's only natural to be afraid, but many allow emotions to drive their lives, to control them. Rage causes people to act uh, irrationally, and fear does the same thing. You know what? Those are two of the two strongest emotions. That is anger and fear. Just as we should not jump into the role of justice without self-examination, repentance and seeking God, we should also not allow fear to turn us away from justice. We have the promise from God that if we'll humble ourselves and pray and repent, God will hear us and heal our land. That's a promise from God. I read it to you earlier. We read it together. All we have to do is humble ourselves, pray and repent. God considers apathy as evil as those who are actually in rebellion against him. We are commanded to do good even if there is a cost to it. Only the Christian has the hope, though, beyond that cost. It doesn't matter what it costs us. If it costs us our lives, we still have the life everlasting. Hallelujah. Therefore, we should be bold in the face, in the face of sacrifice or danger. With sorrow, God executes judgment. He's not happy about judging his people. To be angry over acts of senseless violence is natural. And it's right if we keep it with God's purpose. Anger is an emotion that God created. He gave us our emotions. Like all emotions, anger should not rule us or fear. Emotions are designed by God to be our tools, tools in our hand, tools to help us act right. However, when we're not being led by God, we become tools, we become the tools, and our emotions control us instead of us controlling our emotions. So in conclusion today, I want you to know something. Christians, we should always stand against evil. Always stand Stand against. Don't be afraid. Stand against evil. We are commanded by God to do so. And we are equally commanded not to become part of that evil, uh, of that, evil that we're called to stand against. There must be, though, first a genuine humbling and repentance and submission to God. And only God has a right to execute his wrath. If we are executing our wrath, guess what? We are in sin. The focus should always be obedience to God. If we are on God's side, we will always win. Hallelujah. It is possible to separate our feelings from our decision-making without prayer, self-examination. In fact, it's very impossible very impossible to separate our feelings from our decision-making without prayer, without self-examination, without repentance, and praying for our enemies. It is God who must use the authority that he has set up in this world to execute his justice. It's him. He must do it. Don't lose sight of this. Never lose sight of the purpose of judgment. The goal is to right what was wrong, to make what was wrong right. The goal is peace. And I'm not talking about the absence of war. I'm talking about peace. No fear, hallelujah. God's joy. That is peace. The goal is to stand against evil so that righteousness from God can give us his freedom. That is the goal. Praise the Lord. Let us pray, please. 
Our Father in heaven, mighty God, we humble ourselves before you, and we do, Lord, exactly what you tell us to do. At least, Lord, we're trying to right now. We're trying, Lord, to humble ourselves before you and pray for our hearts, Lord, to be purified. Even as David prayed, Lord, purify our hearts, please. Purify us, Lord, and take our sins away. Cover them with the blood of Jesus. Lord, if there's someone who hears this voice, hears this message, and they don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do, Lord, what you have said you will do, Lord, and you would convict hearts, you would change hearts, Lord, and they will come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, your people, for not standing, Lord, for what's right, for not calling out sin. And, but, Lord, we have to look at ourselves first. We have to be right with you, Lord. We know that, Lord. We have to be right with you. Help us to be right. Help us, Lord, because of our weakness, have mercy on us. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen.